Welcome to the Hustle Culture Podcast, where we highlight everyday entrepreneurs living their hustle and making a difference. Carlos? What's happening, all of you hustlers out there? Welcome to episode one of Hustle Culture. We are your hosts, Carlos Gill and Tayo Roxon. And joining us today is Miss Audrey Bellis. Audrey is the founder of Startup Downtown LA and Grid 110. And I don't want to steal her thunder because we all want to hear from Audrey, but I have been following Audrey for a few years now on social media. She's totally amazing. She's someone who's building this amazing startup community in LA. And keep your eyes set on Audrey because I'm telling you firsthand, this woman is amazing and she is on the start of doing some really big, amazing things in the business community. So welcome to Hustle Culture, Audrey. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and glad you guys can see and hear me. Apologies to those who couldn't at the beginning. <laughs> no, it's quite all right. And you, you know, you're the first guest. So that's, that's you know, that, that's, that's an honor in it of itself. But we want you to tell us your story. Because Carlos has been telling me all about you. Yeah. He says, you got to meet Audrey. She's doing this amazing <laughs> thing. She's like this fun fatale. Real talk. But um, what is, what is your story? Tell your story. Uh, yeah, so I started Startup DTLA this last year as um, an initiative realizing that so many people come to LA and they go to Silicon Beach, right? That's where they think the tech community is. And we have, you know, I look at downtown LA and I call it the full stack city. We have just a little bit of everything. We have finance, we have manufacturing, we have um, everything you can possibly imagine. We have fashion, we have art, we have culture, we have dining, legal tech civic tech with open data with our mayor's office first mayor to ever open up city hall like that most technological savvy mayor in america and i looked at downtown and i said why is this not a tech hub um the other thing that i saw was you know personal experience i had uh, built an e-commerce tech startup i worked remotely for another tech startup and my only options were to go to silicon beach there was nothing in downtown for me and i said that's crazy I don't see how that's, uh, how that's even happening right now. How do we begin to bridge those gaps? So right. um, I was at a co-working space for a while, and I noticed a lot of people would outgrow our co-working space and move on to other places, and typically they would leave downtown, which is a big problem. Uh, the other thing we have in downtown that's an epidemic right now is 6 million square feet of empty Class A office space in a two-and-a-half-mile radius. 6 million square feet of empty office space and startups that are desperately looking for space and with fiber internet. It's the only place in downtown you can get fiber internet is in these towers and yet they're empty. And I said, mm -hmm. so, you know, being the matchmaker that I am to some degree, I go, how do we begin to bring startups in space that need internet and come together and right. create a little burgeoning community? So Startup DTLA was born out of that. Um, we really do three things. We help people find office space. We host a central calendar of events for all things downtown tech, which pre previous to us didn't exist. And we're building the biggest list of known tech companies that are in downtown, who's gotten funded, how much and by whom, which again, if you don't tell people that, they're not gonna wanna come here because they don't realize it's even happening. It's like mm -hmm. a marketing agency for downtown startups. Very cool. So Audrey, let's, let's take it back a few notches. Tell us sure. about your evolution from where you started to where you're at today, because, you know, that's really the story that we want to, we want to hone in on is we want to know your ascent to where you're at. We want to really get into the hustle, right? So yeah. at what point did you determine, you know what, I'm not going to work for the man. I'm not going to work for a corporate entity. Instead, I want to have my own business and do my mm -hmm. own thing. That's a good question. So honestly, I think I've always just been a little bit unemployable. Like when I was little, my mom probably asked me what I wanted to be. And I think I told her I wanted to be the dictator of my own country. <laughs> you know, I'm small. I'm a petite person. I have a slight Napoleon complex. Um, I'm also the oldest child. Uh, so I think I've always had that. I think the other part of it, especially this last maybe four to five years, was I had a broken engagement in my mid-20s that left me six figures in debt that he walked away from and said, too bad, good luck with that, it's in your name. And wow. it was a very, you know, I'm grateful for the experience. I wouldn't be where I am today. But it was one of those things where it was like, if I went and got a nine to five, I'd be paying that off the rest of my life. Wow. Um, if I was self-employed, I had no ceiling. The opportunities were mine, but that's not to say that it was, you know, uh, 
roses and sunshine the whole way. It was hard. Mm -hmm. That hustle, you know, there's a lot of truth to that line. You don't know my struggle. You can't know my hustle, right? Right. Um, and those struggles are real. And uh, I remember, you know, there was a long time when I first got started where it was like making choices like, can I afford my hosting this month? I can't afford mm -hmm. somebody to help me build my website. So I'm staying up at night with Smashing Magazine tutorials going, this is a WordPress template. This is mm -hmm. a plugin. Here's how you make these things work together because I had no other choice. And when you don't have choices, you become incredibly resourceful. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. So it, that really was it. I mean, that's what started it. And it was a matter of just, um, just being digging familiar. myself out of that hole. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that resourceful time, that period where everything was low? Because I'm, you know, I've talked to Carlos about it sometimes when I couldn't pay the bills. Or I was wondering where I was living month to month, rent to rent. But can you tell us what it was like for your family, friends, and then that decision where you had to make where, am I really going to keep doing this or should I actually just go back into the nine to five world? Because a lot of entrepreneurs yeah. on their way, they, they have that, that turning point where they, they either decide to push through the hard time or they go back to, you know, the nine to five because, you know, they have to pay the bills and they don't want to be further in debt. And you had that broken engagement. Um, yeah. 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 So um, I can tell you right now from my family, it was very much, we support you, but we don't, we don't understand this. I don't come from a family of entrepreneurs. Um, I'm a first generation child. My parents very much are, especially my mom, you know, have this mentality of you came, we came here for you to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, marry wow. a doctor, lawyer, engineer. And if you're not a doctor, lawyer, engineer, what did we sacrifice to give you these things for? Uh, we believe in the American dream, right? The 30 year fixed mortgage, husband, wife, two kids, dog, picket fence. And my parents right. very much live that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really not for me. That's not what I'm looking for. I mean, everybody wants stability, but I, I mm -hmm. love my life now. And I think that was very hard for them to understand. And even now, um, I think they're incredibly proud of me. But I think they also look at it and go, why would you reach for something that's not secure? Um, but I also look at them and say, those things don't exist anymore. Jobs with, that you work out for 35 years with a pension um, mm -hmm. are few and far between. Uh, I, I love startup life. I love the hustle of building something for two years and moving on to something else. I like the beginnings of things. Yeah. Um, you like to build. I like yeah. to build and scale. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, I think that was hard for them to understand. And because I came from a fam, I come from a family that really aren't entrepreneurs. Nobody else is really self-employed. It's hard. They look at me and they go, why would you want to struggle? And I look at them and think, gosh, I would just absolutely die if I had to go and sit in a cubicle all day long. Like that would right. kill me more than the depression of, oh crap, I don't know if I can pay my bills this month. Like that's yeah. scary, but I know me and I sit here and go, I believe in myself and I'm going to get myself out of this because I, I know my value. I know what I can do. Um, mm. Sitting and relying on somebody else absolutely just is not something I could do. And that was hard because it was isolating. I felt incredibly alone. Audrey Taylor Carlos got it on the big screen <laughs> over here. And Sorry. So, so Audrey, you know, I, I want to touch on something. So you're, you're in your mid twenties, you're going through this, uh, you know, this crisis, if you will, and you are looking to learn how to code, how to make websites, how to really, um, you know, use social media to leverage your talents to actually build something. And, and I think it's very admirable. I really want to know, were your friends there for you while you were going through that? There were a few friends that I can honestly say were there in the darkest times of it. Right. Um, I think people fall away. There's a Chuck Palahniuk mm -hmm. who wrote, um, who wrote uh, Fight Club has this fantastic line where he goes, um, everybody steps back when the pool of your mm -hmm. blood gets a little too close to their shoes, right? Okay. Um, I think people don't know how to be compassionate uh, if they haven't been through those things. I think people don't know how to sympathize with you and it's not because they don't want to, it's because they don't know what to say. So sometimes the things that they can say can come off as hurtful. It's like, well, why don't you just go get a job? Um, I don't know. Why don't you just do your own thing? Like you want to, you know, respond back with yeah. those yeah, with absolutely. rude, smart ass remarks. But that's, you know, I really come to recognize that people can only love you and support you in the ways that they know how. And the way that they show you that doesn't mean that they're not supporting you. They may think that they're doing everything that they can to support you. Um, it's, 
it's your choice of how you choose to look at it. And I can honestly be blessed to say I have a few friends that I absolutely there for me and always, you know, believed in my potential mm -hmm. uh, and said, you know, you're not victim. You're not a victim of your circumstance. And I went through a very big depression after that. I mean, I, I honestly can say I spent six months in bed and mm -hmm. didn't function. That's I absolutely did not function. Yeah, you know, and I, I think that's representative of the life of an entrepreneur, right? You know, what people see online is typically the roses, right? They see the W's. And yep. you know, throughout my progression of my career, especially over the last seven years, where you know, I started Jobs Direct, a lot told me personally, that's why I asked you the question, a lot of people that I thought were friends told me I was crazy and they weren't there for me when I was going through those struggles. But then the other spectrum is when you get a cool job, like working at LinkedIn, all of a sudden everyone wants to be your friend. Everyone comes out of the woodwork. Yeah. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's, it's really, it's really interesting because you see who's there for you when you're at your lowest point. And I'll be the first to say when you're at your lowest point is when you are working your absolute hardest. And I see being at your lowest point is really being at the peak because that's when you're hungriest. That's when you're really to go out and get it the most. Absolutely. You know, I, um, I try to teach that to everybody. I, I think everything we do comes from a sense of worthiness, right? Mm -hmm. So when I went through that six month depression, I didn't feel worthy. I just felt like I had failed. I had failed myself. And really that's where the depression came from. It wasn't that I had a broken engagement, like screw that, whatever. I thought if anything, it was the worst, you know, it was one of those things where I felt instant relief. Like, Oh, I knew I wasn't on the right track. I was doing this for the wrong reasons. Right. Um, it was the aftermath where you sit and you realize, man, I've compromised my integrity for believing in something that I thought I needed to be doing instead of being authentic to myself. Right. right. That's really where I felt lost. Um, so I really believe everything that you do comes stems from a sense of whether you feel worthy or not. Like you either believe you're worthy or you're hustling for other people to believe it. And when you're sitting there hungry, um, to strive to build your business. And like you said, you're going through those, those low points. Um, you have, that's where, whether you believe you're worthy determines whether you're going to succeed or not. Yeah. If I believe I'm worthy of this, when I'm going out and asking for that client and making the big ass saying, here's the dollars, here's the contract. Here's what I, here's what I can do for you. If I feel worthy, I'm going to close it. If I don't feel worthy, they're going to pick up on that. And they're not, and it's not because they didn't want my stuff or I wasn't ready for it. It's because I didn't feel like it was my time and I didn't make that ask. So I started this series called the Worthy Women Series under Startup DTLA for female founders. And we focus events every two weeks on different work-life balance topics. But it comes down to that. It's, you know, where do you believe that you're worthy and where do you not and why? What's holding you? What's the limiting belief system that's holding you back from that? Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I love about you, Audrey, is just hearing your story now and hearing Carlos talk about you is that, you know, you're a voice for many of the voiceless. But, you know, many of the times you were talking about you and I have this similarity where, I, you know, I come from another country and your parents send you here to achieve one thing. It's a doctor, lawyer or, you know, some form of professional. You get your MBA, you go down this path, or, you know, your your degree, everything's all set up, you get that married life. But then what happens when you decide to deviate because it's not something that you want. And you did that. You said you, you had the personal, uh, things from the personal side, the engagement, the, um, the loss after that, the six month depression, the parents sort of support you, supporting you. And many of us know that where it's the parent guilt. So like, ah, we love you, but we really think you should be doing something else. Right. And, and then, you know, so what happens is that the, your community becomes, you can become surrounded by many people that are not necessarily helping you, or uplifting you. Did you find that you needed to be in these environments to get inspired? You know, how did you get inspired out of these environments? And how did you just realize that you're worth, like you said? And then how did you even say, I want to be this beacon in downtown LA and also for women, uh, female entrepreneurs? You know, that's a, that's a great point. I honestly never thought like, hey, I want to be a beacon. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that I would consider myself that now. But oh, you I are. Think it... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, blushing over here. I, I think those things just kind of happened organically. You know, I, can I cuss on this? Am I allowed to drop s bombs? Go for it. Hey, uh, drop it like it's hot. Hashtag no fucks given all the time. Um, mm -hmm. It's my favorite phrase. And people go, oh, you're so cold. You turn off. You give no fucks. I go, actually, I give a shit ton of fucks. Um, <laughs> I give so many fucks, but I'm, I'm selective about the ones that I give, right? 
And that's mm -hmm. where it goes. No fucks given is very much um, getting rid of the BS for me. Um, right. So mm -hmm. as a beacon, you know, I really, it wasn't about that. I think I just felt so isolated for so long and so alone. Um, and I don't know that I found it on social media. I actually found it through writing. I was asked to um, write a piece for the Times of Israel when they first started. My friend was their um, new media director. And she said, hey, we're just starting. We need a piece. We know you come from an interfaith family. I know you have a story to tell. Would you be willing to write about it? And I did, and it went viral. It was a top 10 red piece that year. And it, yeah. it was an authentic piece about, you know, going through that broken engagement, rebuilding. And it was through that writing community and subsequently social media where I had a lot of people reach out and say, I've been through the same thing. I, I know your struggle. I've been there. And I don't feel like I can talk about it with anybody because I'm embarrassed. And really what it is, is I feel ashamed. I feel shame is the big word, right? Um, yeah. And so being able to talk about that and say, you know, I live by this philosophy, you can't raise your net worth until you raise your self-worth. And for me to raise your self-worth is to teach, right? You heal by teaching and being honest with people and saying, this is my situation and here's how I overcome it. It's it's not a hero's journey. I'm not, I'm not perfect. I stumble every day, but every day I just try to bring a little more grace than I did yesterday, mm -hmm. just a little bit more. And if you can bring just a little bit more, you can bridge those small right actions into bigger steps. And I think for other people, giving them permission to tell their story because you're willing to tell yours is the most powerful thing, the powerful gift that you can give because it allows people to resonate, to um, have compassion for you and to have compassion for themselves. Because that's the other thing, right? You can't have compassion yeah. for other people when you're not yeah. compassionate for yourself. And I was so, we're the hardest people on ourselves, especially as entrepreneurs. Um, so for me, I had to learn that. And I, you know, can't sit here and say, oh, other people weren't compassionate for me. I wasn't compassionate for myself. I had to learn that um, and you say, can, it's okay to be enough. And this is yeah, enough and, today. And, and and that's exactly why I said the beacon thing right away. Because I saw that you written, you know, for these lights. And when, when I say voice for the voiceless, there are many people that tend to relate to someone that's just real and raw. You wrote something, it got viral because people related to it. Many people yeah. in the world hate their jobs. I mean, there's a stat out there that people hate their jobs, but they stay there for whatever reason. But you yep. were out. Ask yeah, most. yeah, and most people do. I mean, you were out there doing what a lot of people hadn't, you know, you know, weren't brave enough to do or just didn't feel like they were at a point in life to do. So yeah. being that being, being that voice, whether it's for one person, is very important because you never know, right? You never know yep. the impact it can have. Now, staying in that vein, in, in this, this downtown LA and the media and social media, yep. how, how did you start building communities because one of the things that happens is you, you build a company you have you have, <laughs> golden handcuffs that's correct <laughs> uh, but you have a community um you start building um uh, a platform and then you need to get the word out there right you need to get yeah. clients you need to get a community you need to get people to i always say evangelize your, your product your service what was this what was the next step you did uh who did you reach out to and how did you just start you know saying this is my tribe Oh, so there were two ways that I did that. One was hosting events, meetups, um, community events, because a lot of people sat here and said, you know, the biggest challenge in downtown LA Tech is people go, where's the community? If I could find it, I'd plug into it, but I don't know where it exists. There's all these different co-working spaces, but nobody really works together. Where is the central community? So hosting events was a big way to bring people physically together, especially downtown. Yeah. You have all these high rises. You look up and you're like, well, I don't know who's in there. How's that a community, right? I'm walking around, there's tons of us, but where are you? Yeah. Uh, so actually meeting that way. And then through social media, I've met so many incredible people via Twitter and Instagram, um, particularly Twitter. Some of my best friends, my girl squad I met on Twitter. And uh, one of my best friends, her name's Mickey. Squad girls. Yeah, that's <laughs> us. We're, we even have a hashtag. We're the Madres because we're two Audrey's and two M's. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering where us. that came from. Um, <laughs> and my friend Mickey um, is the city manager for General Assembly downtown LA. She launched uh, that territory. And she was really passionate about building a community. And, um, you know, mutually, we met on Twitter. We started reaching out. We realized we had a lot of people in the same circles. And it, you know, you don't do those things alone. You do it by building community together. So we started doing that Um partnering together to, you know, she's a fellow co-founder for Grid 110, which is our nonprofit. Um, it really is about meeting people and just doing stuff together. And it's not always online. It's, you know, a mix of online and in person. And for the online mm -hmm. part, you know, I work with the mayor's office. Um, I work with other city 
entities and business improvement districts and, you know, talk about social media. I'm notoriously known for oversharing. When you see the En La Noche hashtag, you know it's Audrey After Dark. It's going on. Audrey. En La Noche, there's it's something after going dark down. Or it's happy involves. hour. It's one of the two. There are, there are yes. cigars involved or exactly. yeah, yeah, beverage. Preferably <laughs> single involved. malt. So, uh, so, so Audrey, I, you know, I got to say, and, and you know this because I've told you, I think the world of you. I think you are one of the people I enjoy following the most. I've seen this progression over the last couple of years, and I definitely see you as being a rising and shining star in this industry. But you know what? You are actually out there doing things while you have a presence on social media. You're not constantly yeah. posting on social media. You're actually out working. So for those that aren't as familiar with you, Tell us what your day-to-day uh, -day looks like. I do a lot like. of meetings. I do a lot of uh, in-person stuff. So I actually don't use any tools to schedule posts, which is, you know, I'm sure every, most people watching this are going, what? How uh, dare you, Audrey? What are you doing? I don't push out content just to push out content. Uh, I don't you mean you're not buffer. using Buffer? I have it. Um, and I... I don't. That's actually it. a really good strategy. I engage real time with you. I mean, granted, my phone is ninety nine percent of the time stuck to my hand or face, um, but my day to day is uh, very typical. I get up early. Um, I meditate. Um, I go to daily mass almost every day. Uh, I go into the office um, and get some emails done. I probably say three days of my week are meetings. Uh, either meetings, in-person collaboration, face-to-face -face time. The other days are um, admin, as you, if you want to call it, strategy uh, behind the mm -hmm. scenes. I have help at Startup DTLA. I've got two great team members that are phenomenal. And Grid 110, um, which is our nonprofit, there are seven co-founders. So we, uh, thankfully, it's not, you know, you're running it solo. We've got support. Okay. Yeah. And events. No, I do a lot of events and happy hour nights and no. Nights I mean, and look, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm, I'm I'm starting to do more events and I'm definitely learning a lot. Like the, it's one thing to have an online experience. It's nothing to have an offline experience because it just maximizes it so much. Uh, but it, yeah. you know, if you find that right mix, it's great. You said seven co-founders. That's very yeah. that just that that perked my ears. And one of the things reasons it did is because your team is very important when you're doing a startup. I when I first launched my startup. I had I had this great idea. I was gonna do like yeah, you know, all my friends that I felt like would work. I'm gonna, you know, get them to work with me. And then we had our weekly meetings. And then I was like, yeah, you guys are not you are not on the same page. Yeah. And that happened for two two weeks. And I had to go through the process of cutting, and cutting, and cutting because they they weren't on the same page. And then it always made me uh, always made me realize that if you don't have a good team, your startup is only gonna go so far. So. Yep. And, and many people, a lot of times, will say, keep it small, keep it small. You have seven. Why do you have seven? So we really started. So Grid 110 is an economic development um, entity as a nonprofit, and we apply an accelerator type model. So we have uh, space with one of our space partners. We're in partnership with Mayor Garcetti. Um, and what we do is we offer free space to five select startups that applied for the program. They go through programming and mentoring, and the idea is after the first six months, they're either um, market rate uh, viable office tenants to either move vertically in the building to their own space or somewhere in downtown supporting the downtown economy. Um, they basically go through an accelerator for six months. We have phenomenal people on our board. Mm. Uh, we, you know, we came to this idea. We all came to it from a different point of view. So I came to it from the point of view of Indie Desk saying, if you could eliminate wow. the burden of office space uh, for six months and apply um, mentorship, we would see more companies grow at a more stable rate and stay in downtown. Uh, Stephen, who we elected as our chair, Stephen uh, was our D-Link, downtown LA neighborhood council at large. So he had a lot of community ties. Mickey from General Assembly was our community angle. Justin, who's right. one of our one of our co-founders, um, he has a tremendous uh, programming background um, from having built several startups and an educational background. He's also an adjunct professor for Cal State LA's entrepreneurship program, which was, I think, one of the first uh, bachelors in entrepreneurship you could actually get uh, in yeah. LA. Um, right. and the other two guys, Jared and Prashant, um, they were Y Combinators, one of their most successful cohorts last year. 
Uh, oh, yeah. They yeah. Uh, founded Aikido Labs in partnership with USC Digital Health. They've built and sold companies. So everybody brings their level to experience. And so for us, it's very important for us because it's so many you know, cooks in the kitchen. We started this thing together. We consider each other fellow co-founders. Um, we all have a specific vertical that we manage. Like Because I work with a lot of building owners and space in downtown, I'm the building ops person. Uh, somebody else handles fundraising. Somebody else handles marketing, programming. We all split up our vertical, and we own that vertical, right? We get input from each other, but essentially, we are the owner of that specific vertical for how we operate. And then as a board of directors, we meet together and make executive decisions. Um, and it's really important for us to keep and stay in our sandboxes, because when we start crossing over, personalities get in the mix, Right. Whereas start at BTLA, I'm a solo co-founder. I have people that work with me, but I'm I'm alone at the top making decisions, um, which is sometimes fantastic because you do stuff on your own. But it also is challenging because there's not always somebody uh, balancing you saying, hey, you've gone way far off on a tangent, which is why mentors are so important and advisors. Wow. If you're a solo co-founder or even if you're not, you need your mentors mm -hmm. and you need your advisors. You did, and and before before Carla Carlos got it, is gonna read a question from Joe there, but um, I just want to say everybody, please give her major prop bomb, because she's killing it with the with the content today. And then um, one thing I wanted to touch on was the diversity you said. Seven co-founders is certainly unique, but yeah. um, Carlos and I, or you know, Carlos knows me. I'm all about culture and diversity. That's what I did. I yeah. grew up in five five countries, four continents. It's all I talk about. I feel like I'm a cultural connector, but <clears throat> you know, Carlos is a you know, you know, excuse me, Hispanic American, you're also Hispanic American, but your team is diverse. You said everybody brings their own thing to the table and they own that vertical. And diversity yep. is not just race, it's not just ethnicity, but it's concepts, you know. We have gender. to also be a mix of gender and races as well. We're gender, like a rainbow. Exactly. Gender, exactly. <laughs> but the reason, yeah, the That's reason I brought important. that up is because I always say diversity fosters innovation. It creates unique angles about solving problems, and also gives people unique perspectives and looking at, at solutions. So, um, before Carlos read that question, I wanted to know if you found that to be true because I, I honestly think that um, we live in a diverse world. This is the most diverse generation we've ever had. I was just like, and it's, it makes no sense for us to work together the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, um, it's so it it does help. I think it's incredibly important. Um, the other thing that I think is so uh, critical is, you know, we all come from different backgrounds, but our choices are what unite us. So for mm. us as founders of Grid 110, some of us weren't born in L.A., some of us are L.A. loyalists, some of us, you know, whatever our backgrounds are, we all chose downtown to live here, work here, or play here. We made right. that choice, so we're passionate about the community. So while we may be uh, different in so many senses, our biggest uniting factor is our choice to see downtown as um, – not just the major metropolitan hub that it is, but as a tech hub. Ah, uh, see, Carlos, what is what is she doing? This is what I like to say. She is using her difference to make a difference. That's what everybody to says. make a difference. Yes, that's a good line. Well, here's the thing. So, so when when I when I first came across Audrey, I was I was drawn in because here I am seeing seeing a a younger woman. She's Latina, and she's just totally grabbing the world by the balls, if I can say that, and she is making it hers, okay? She is actually making things happen, and that's why, like, honestly, and Audrey can tell you, every time I go to L.A., I'll send her a message and say, I just arrived in L.A., home of future <laughs> mayor, Audrey Bellis. That's where she's going to take hey, this thing. No, she's not afraid to dream big, and she goes, she goes about it in her own way, and she's not ashamed to be herself. That's the most no. important thing. I think, I think when you're doing – with entrepreneurship, sorry, so, when you go entrepreneurship, the biggest thing is to always stay true to who you are, and that reminds you of your passion all the time. Right. So okay. we do have a question from the audience, and, and anyone that's watching us here on Blab, if you want to ask Audrey a question, make sure that you drop it in the comment box below. Let's also take a second to tell a little bird so we can invite more folks out from the Blab community on here and watch Audrey tell her amazing story. So question from Joe Wilson TV. And this is, again, going back yeah. to you having several co-founders for Startup DTLA. He wants to know, does coordination of all the individual efforts eat a lot of time? Mm -hmm. And how do so, you juggle So our co-founders, we have seven co-founders, actually, Grid 110, not Startup DTLA. Um, does it eat a lot of time? It did in the beginning, but we use systems like Slack, right? It's unfeasible to have a seven-person meeting where everyone's going to be available every single week. And we tried that. It was a disaster. 
Um, so we have, you know, the bulk of meetings, you need to attend 75% of the meetings. They're on set days. They're every, um, they're on the second and fourth Mondays of every month. We pick the most, you know, we did a vote and said, hey, what are the most feasible days that everybody can be available? And we use internal communication. We use Slack religiously, um, you know, group email, uh, uh, you know, email, Gchat, Google Apps. Um, we find ways together to do that. And really, it comes down to trust, right? So I have to trust that if I'm doing my part, my fellow co-founders are doing theirs. And if they're not, I also have to trust that they'll come to us and say, I can't do this. I need time. I don't have time. Can you take this off of me? Can you take this burden so that resentment doesn't build up? And transparency. It's incredibly important that we're transparent both with each other on uh, the teams that we're working with. And so you know, getting to know each other, I think because we really uh, planned for about six months and had team building stuff before we really narrowed down specifically what we were doing. We took a, th those six months really, I mean, looking back, sometimes we say, oh, we took too long to get started. Look where we're at now. We could have done that sooner. I don't think that's true. I think we were built, we were team building, right? You can't build trust yeah. overnight. And because we were getting to know each other mm -hmm. and each other's styles, um, I think if we had started sooner, we would have fallen on our faces. I think the fact that we took the time to get to know each other, know each other's personalities. And we had other people that started with us that were phased out due to other time commitment or just not the right personality fits. Um, right. Right. It feels like we have a really committed core team. We're like a little family um, and we have the internal disputes like everybody does. Um, <laughs> but we have each other's back, right? There's a, there's a loyalty there and everybody has that shared commitment of we chose to be here. I owe this to other people and I owe it to myself. And mm -hmm. if not to have that, you know, transparency to say, this is no longer for me. Um, because if, yeah. if you can't trust other people to tell you that you're, yeah. you're headed for disaster. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what you know. I mean, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I, Oh, no, no, go I was ahead, just saying I was going to be I'm very disappointed because I didn't know that you were a bunch of slackers. But now I found out that you slack all the time and it's it, it's disappointing. But the thing, though, is communication. Yes. Trust. Transparency, tra transparency trust. Yep. And adaptability. Right. You guys yep. adapted all the times. And those were the things that, that worked for you guys. People yep. were phased out due to time commitment or not. But um, it, it's keeping those thing, those uh, four or five things core and uh, making sure that they are consistent, right? Yeah. Um, can I re respond to a question that I just read right now? Um, yeah, absolutely, go for Uria, it. Uria, Uria, um, yeah, it says, I, so. I know you do on the mic stuff, Audrey, do you have a podcast or is Blab going to be a new outlet for your biz, personal passions? That's a great question. So I do do on the mic events all the time. I speak at stuff. I'll be speaking at the Mattel Women's Conference coming up in November. Um, and there's, so there's two parts to that. I love a live audience because I, my energy feeds off somebody else's, right? And okay. you, um, there's a lot of passion that comes in when you're in a room full of people that are, that are resonating with your story or, you know, vice versa. I've previously really struggled with things like video logs because there's, you're talking to yourself. I feel so awkward and self-conscious, <laughs> um, you know, and very, and you're very aware of your flaws when you're doing that. You're, Man, that's the devil chin, tuck it in. Um, but I, <laughs> yeah, the perfect, the right? Perfect Is this angle. my selfie face? Did I, did I do the lips? Um, I actually, you know, being my first time on Blab today, I really like this um, cleaner interface than Google Hangouts. Um, but I love that you still get the interaction with people. Um, so I think I might explore it. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do my own podcast, but I think, uh, being able to have conversations like this, you know, it feels like an in-person meeting. It's, um, I mean, I can't sniff you. It's not pheromones or anything, but, uh, <laughs> I can, you know, see your facial expressions and it's not, it's not a phone call on the other side. And that's another personal quirk about me. I don't like to take phone calls. I do enough with phone call. I can't see what you're looking like. I don't know if you're multitasking, doing other things, but on a video chat, I can get just as much done and I feel like I have a deeper connection to somebody. And typically that results in moving things faster versus calls to have calls, to have meetings, to have meetings. Right. right. Well, I mean, Uri Uriah disagrees with you. First of all, he says you're, you look amazing. <laughs> he says you're doing great. So um, I, you know, I think you might've found something. I, uh, I'm going to invite Mitch on here, but Carlos, I don't know if you wanted to say something. Mitch. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Audrey, if you have time, we'd love to hang out with you here for, for a little longer. I know there's a join in and 
ask you questions directly. So joining us from a somewhere. sandy white. That's right. It's a secret, it's a secret location, South of Orange County. But it's so funny. I'm waiting to come on. And Audrey, you're talking about double chin, how we look, right? <laughs> and the reality, <laughs> I'm like, I just, I just got done sweating my butt off. And I'm like, I love this platform. I love what Tyler and Carlos are doing. I just wanted to introduce myself and say hi. Great conversation, you guys. This is what I like about Blab. I'm taking a breather, and rather than just, you know, hanging out, I click in, and I'm listening to just really good content. And I love what I hear the three of you talking about. Tap into the old bulls, though, okay? Tap into some of us that have been in business 30, 40 years. Not 40 years, but 30 years, because there are a lot of old-school techniques that yeah. you can use today millennials can tap into. I mean, we've made our mistakes. We know what works and what doesn't work. Uh, being on the beach on a Saturday morning is a great way to decompress so that when, um, Audrey, when you hit the ground running on Monday morning, you're kicking ass in L.A. and on your way to becoming our next great mayor. You know, <laughs> Thanks, you, Mitch. You've you got to have the energy, yeah. right? Yeah, so that's really <laughs> critical. So people always ask me, how do you manage your time? And I take a personal Wednesday every Wednesday. I don't work on Wednesdays. Sometimes I have Wednesday night events, especially the Worthy Women, but that's a two-hour panel in the evening and it's over cocktails. Um, I don't work during the day on Wednesdays. I don't answer emails, I don't take meetings. It's my personal Wednesday and I'm religious about it. And I'll tell you what, and I learned that from a mentor who said, you're no good to anybody when you burn out. When you take care of yourself, you'll deliver a better product and better quality service. You're a better service to people when you can be of service to yourself, right? Um, so I that's great it. advice. And some of the best things that I'm doing, I honestly, I wouldn't be doing any of the things that I'm doing today if it hadn't been for a particular mentor in my life. Um, that was a very personal relationship to me. So mentors and advisors are absolutely the most um, valid pool of talent that you can draw from and say, hey, you know, help me, teach me. And I think when you search for mentors, it's like searching for co-founders. You have to court them a little bit. It's like dating, finding the right one, the right fit. Right. Um, and, you know, being somebody that you genuinely want to learn from uh, and not necessarily just pedestal and going, I want the pretty stuff, but say, hey, I want to learn how to get myself out of this tough stuff, too. Yeah, yeah. And, I love and it. Just, I love it. just a question, just a question here while I have all of you on. Uh, one one comment um, is uh, one of our, our Blab staunch supporters says that when you host a Blab, you get a video and audio file. So in case you want to repurpose mm -hmm. that, it's already there for you to do that. And then, um, so that could be something. I mean, and then Mia says, um, you want, I'm going to mute, I'm going to mute him a little bit just because the, the wave, sorry, but I'll, 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 Here, I'll let me talk mute. to you I'll... soon, Mitch. But the thing is, he, um, Maria wants to know if you can elaborate on transparency and Mitch, I would love to hear your, your point of view on this and Carlos as well. And I'll share mine, but what is the, uh, your point and your advice on transparency? What do you mean by that? How transparent do you need to get? And then how does it help your business? Is that to me? Yeah, Mitch. Yeah, and, real uh, quick. Okay, all right. And then I'll pop off and leave the seat open. Uh, real quick, you guys. What's interesting is I just don't want people to think I'm videotaping them. So I've got the piece. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as transparent as I am, I also want to respect the other people's privacy. And you know what's interesting about mentorship is there was a time I was on a blab a couple of days ago, and we used to have used to have to hop on the plane, fly across the country to sit down and have lunch with someone to get mentored. Okay, and it's easier than ever now to connect with people that can make a huge difference in your life. And that's what I'm really excited about these platforms is it allows you to connect with people very easily. And when it comes to being transparent, look, I'm a trial lawyer, this is what I do. Um, you don't see a lot of trial lawyers in a t-shirt, dirty t-shirt, you know, high school football hat, doing this <laughs> stuff. It just shows another side of me and that's what I really enjoy embracing as you guys know. We're all, you know, we all have belly buttons, right? And there's, right. Nothing, wrong, there's nothing wrong with showing your belly buttons. Yep. And so, What's really cool about today's technology, about today's business world, is being able to connect with people, me connecting with the three of you, and, um, and then seeing where the relationship goes. And I'm really excited next week. I'll be at Periscope Community New York. I'm going to be connecting with some people who I've only met online, and now we get to meet in real life. But what I found out just this morning is a friend of mine just down the street, his daughter is going to be at, in New York next week. And her name's her name's her name's Julie oh, Wickstrom. Cool. She's on Periscope. She's got a couple of different shows. Everybody needs to reach out to Julie. She is an up and coming superstar, right. and and I just can't wait to introduce Julie to all of my friends back in the, back in the Big Apple. It's going to be huge. It's going to uh, be fun. So, 
Yeah, and you also know, Mitch, you also know that I live in New York, so I'm just saying. I'm saying. I'm in the city. That's well, all I'm going to say. You know, you know who I'm supposed to have coffee with is James Altucher. Do you know James? Yes, yes. So oh, wow. we're going to oh, try to get together, I think, on Saturday morning or maybe Saturday afternoon. I'll, uh, when I find out where we're meeting, I'll reach out to you. And if you want to join us, you're more than welcome. Yeah, I'm all about that. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. So, I got to run. Thanks, Thanks. for Thanks. All right, see. Bye, guys. Right. Yeah, I think I think transparency is very important. Thanks a lot for joining us, Mitch. You know, transparency is extremely important. And, you know, a couple things stood out there. And one, that's the power of relationships, the power of networking. You know, I can honestly say I wouldn't be where I'm at in my career today if it wasn't for others out there that helped yeah. open up doors for me. And, you know, a lot of folks don't know my background in depth, but, you know, I didn't go to college. And I got started in corporate America at a young age, lost my job, started up a company, and it's taken me very far places. And none of it would have been possible without two things, two very important characteristics. One mm -hmm. is passion, putting passion before profit and doing things because you're passionate about doing something or accomplishing an overarching mission or goal. And the second is people. You have to value people. And you know why are we doing this here today? Why are we getting together, Tayo, and hosting the Hustle Culture podcast and you know, bringing Adriana to tell her story? It's because we value these relationships. And we realize as long as you're giving back, okay, then others are going to give back to you. And then you know, this, the other is yeah. being transparent. You can't be afraid yeah. to ask for help. Okay, People love to root for the underdog. And that's something I've told buddies of mine throughout the years as you're starting up a business. Don't be afraid to ask people to help you right. out, okay? And keep in mind, you also have to be willing to give right. back and yeah, help and others I, too. And, and before I let the amazing guest of honor just kill it with, with her reason why transparency is great, I'll, you know, I'll be with you, Carlos, we, we met, what, 2013 on Twitter. We kept the conversation going and it was around, um, around a time in my life where <clears throat> you know, I was just transitioning from a job that I hated right out of college and I was deciding where I wanted to go to New York City for my MBA. And um, even getting my MBA, I found that it, the first person I needed to be transparent with was myself. Because I had somehow convinced myself that I needed to be, you know, like, you know, like I said, I come from Nigeria. This is it. You better be a lawyer. You better be that. You better be that. So I was like, Ugh, all right, I'm going to go down this path and do this and make sure I get this, uh, you know, this degree just so I can, you know, put my hours here. So, but I, I did it. I was putting profit before passion. And I wasn't doing what I was passionate about. And then it wasn't until I went to an Ariana Huffington event that I really, you know, just remembered why. Because I was surrounded by so many people. This is what I talk about community. I was surrounded by so many people who were doing what they loved. And were just telling the stories, whether it was vulnerable, whether it was just hard times, tough times. It was just something that I related to. And it reminded me of why I was doing what I was doing in the first place. And I think once I was able to be transparent with myself, it was really then that I really just decided, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to go ahead and just give no, you know, just go ahead and just start building the platform and building a community and getting out in there and focusing on building those relationships. So I think transparency has to start with yourself. And then obviously, as you start to build teams, if you're not transparent, it's like a relationship. If you don't have that trust, you're not transparent. You, and you find out that he or she's cheating on you. It's not going to work out because, well, unless you like getting cheated on, but it's not going to work out. <laughs> it's not going to work out. And then um, it, it just cracks that foundation. Um, so that's my point on transparency, but I'm sure you have lots more points, Audrey. Uh, actually, I think that's one of the best things that you that we've heard this entire time is you can't be transparent with others until you're transparent with yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and owning that and uh, sitting here saying, okay, am I this or am I just projecting this to outwardly because I want other people to do that? And what's the deeper reason? Transparency like you said, is um, we're in relationships with everybody, people that we work with, our friends, our family, our romantic partners. Um, if it's somebody else that you're interacting with, you're having some relationship with them. And if you can't be transparent with them, you're living a lie. You're lying to them and you're giving them a false set mm -hmm. of rules to abide by. And when they respond to that and it's not what you wanted, what did you expect? You weren't up front. And being able to... Um, you know, and here it comes back down to worth, right? When people are not transparent with other people, it's because they don't think they're worthy. They're sitting there thinking they're not going to like me. They're not going to be around if I'm not X, Y, Z. The reality is, is that they probably would. You just didn't believe you were worthy. So you made that choice for them. And I just tell that to people. Um, and I said this in my last relationship. Don't make the choice for me. 
tell me how it is and let me decide whether I want to be a part mm -hmm. of it or not. And that applies to everything, family, business. Don't, don't make my assumptions or choices for me. You tell me, give me the groundwork, show me the lay of the land. And if I want to be a part of it, let that be of my own volition. Not because you gave me a false set of circumstances that I bought into and then feel betrayed by later. Right. Yeah, that's that's great, Audrey. That that is hashtag real talk. So props to you. We're probably going to go live for about another ten to fifteen minutes if that's if that's cool with you. And if anyone wants to take the uh, open seat, we'd love to have you on. Come ask Audrey questions. So let's talk to the folks out there, Audrey. They're either watching on Blab or will be listening to this later on on iTunes. For anyone out there who is looking to start up a new business and get in the game of entrepreneurship, what, where do they start? And what is the most important thing for so them to keep in So I mind? will say this. People's biggest fear about starting is the fact that they haven't started. So I'm going to give you Yogi, one of Yogi Bhajan's five sutras of the Aquarian age. Start and the pressure will be off. Um, and, you know, like I said before, it's bridging small right actions. You don't have to do everything today. You want to push out a minimum viable product. What is the least amount that I can do to begin to test the market and see if this is something viable or if there's a community here, right? Um, it's just getting started. Our barrier to entry has never been so low. You can get a Squarespace site for 10 bucks a month and it's gorgeous with zero coding ability. Man, where was yeah. that five years ago? <laughs> uh, drag and drop your photos. Um, you know, so I operate on a Chromebook. Uh, I do everything in the cloud today. I don't have Microsoft Office. I use Google Docs. Um, right. I do every. There has never been an easier time to start what it is you want to do, and it doesn't have to be your main hustle. It can be your side hustle. Many people go, "Oh, I can't leave that nine to five. I can't leave my job because I need the benefits. I need this. Other people rely on me." I think one of the reasons we don't see a lot of Latina entrepreneurs um, in general is because, you know, we're supporting other people, right? Latina, uh, Latinas and African-American women are statistically the highest uh, single moms out there. Uh, many of us have parents that didn't have um, careers that pay them out pensions and comfortable retirements. Maybe they had factory jobs because they were immigrants and uh, you need to help out your parents, right? Um, so there's a lot of people in those situations. You can have a side hustle. The reality is, is just start, whether it's on Etsy, eBay, Squarespace, Twitter. I don't care where you're starting, but pick a point and say, I'm going to start here and let it take me where my community says it's going to go. And that's the other challenge yeah. I think people see is they try to impose, this is me and my brand. I'm talking at you with my microphone to the community. Love me, love me, buy me, like me. Right? right yeah. That's not actually how it works. You are a product of your community. You mutually cannot exist without each other. So yeah. developing that community, who they are, getting feedback. Are you resonating? What is it about you that mm -hmm. resonates with them? And letting them have an input, right? It's for us, by yeah. us. How do we begin yeah. to give them ownership in building a similar product together? And they become your evangelist and you become theirs because it's, it's shared. Yeah. I mean, it's like... So I've got... I've just... Do it. That's what I do. That <laughs> it is. Do it. It's, it's absolutely a matter of just getting off your ass and starting somewhere. It doesn't matter where you start. You just have to start, and then it's about being consistent. You know, if you did one right thing every day, if you posted one new piece of content to Twitter every single day, that's a consistent action that people mm -hmm. get behind. If you post a regular post on Instagram with a certain style, that is a small right action. Bridging small right actions are what takes you down the path to success. Nobody sits there and is an overnight success. And if you look at it, you either bought those followers or there's something else behind it. There was some secret sauce. The reality is it's just bridging small right actions consistently and authentically. Yeah. Man, that is awesome, Audrey. Awesome, awesome. Everyone, please give Audrey props. some props. Let's prop I'm, about I'm her right now. Like this all day long. Yeah, hey yeah, yeah. So, you no, know, so, the double so hand. I, I got a comment. <laughs> I got, I, I, have, I have a comment and, and also just a question asked. So, there is a lot of my observation has been this over the last, let's say, year. You have a lot of up and coming younger startup entrepreneurs out there. And I'm friends with a lot of these folks on Facebook. I follow them on Twitter. And I see that a lot of them are oftentimes embracing their wins. They're embracing their success. I'm speaking at this event. I'm, I just closed this deal. I've got this in the works. Yep. 
never embracing the failures and the reality of being an entrepreneur, yeah. which is oftentimes being very tight on money, not really being able to make ends meet. So should you embrace your failures yes. and your woes? Absolutely. And I actually was criticized by somebody for this. Somebody, um, I'm sure meaning well, we were in the office uh, in a shared co-working space said, you know, Audrey, you really overshare on Twitter. Like, I get that you feel like you got burned by this the other day, but dude, you shouldn't be sharing that. You got to keep it rosy and positive. And I looked at him and yep. I said, you know what? Then you're not my community and you don't have to follow yep. me. It's cool. I won't be offended. I'll still follow you. Um, you do need to embrace your failures, right? The world is not sunshine and daisies. I have bad days. And sometimes it looks like a manic up and down. My day starts off good. It goes kind of shitty. It gets a little better. It goes down. <laughs> I got to really rally and do that afternoon meditation and bring myself into a better part of the day. Right. Um, because it's a conscious choice, right? You have to choose. And how am I going to respond to this? Am I going to let this affect me? Or am I going to um, take it for what it is, learn from it, and move on? Um, and being able to share that, that's, um, there are failures, you know, people look at you and they see the Instagram photo, they see your Facebook post, they see the wins, maybe they're skipping over some of the stuff or they don't follow you every day and they don't know the struggles. And, um, it's easy for them to go, Oh, things are so perfect. And I'm very much, uh, about showing you where it's not, um, you know, and areas that I struggle in dating, right trust, right? You, you get burned a little, you get kicked in the teeth a few times and it's hard to keep smiling. Yeah. Uh, dating is an area that yeah. I struggle in. Um, being able to uh, trust other people, that was something I had to overcome, right? Um, you know, my ex was my partner. That's, that's hard. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of co-founders that are partners. Um, you know, there's just fertility. Um, I'm facing some infertility issues at a young age that I've been going through for quite some time and being able to share that with people because they look at you and they go, Oh my gosh, how are you saying age where you're thinking about settling down and having kids? And you're like, you're like, Hey, wow. that's so maybe not going to happen for me. Um, and you know, things right. like wow. I'm bouncing around in between meetings, but I'm also bouncing around in between tons of doctor's appointments right now and ultrasounds and things of, you know, facing an early hysterectomy before I'm 30. Um, and that's something that's hard, right? Because it leaves you a little hormonal, a little emotional. Um, but being able to say, like, not, the world is not perfect. I'm not perfect. And I think it's important that we, we share those things because we relate to each other in our struggles, not in our successes. Yeah. And, and that's what the hustle culture is about. You know, Carlos and I were Snapchatting because now, you know, now I'm into Snapchat because I listen to Saba. Saba and Carlos are like, yeah, the Snapchat. So I started doing that. But uh, we were Snapchatting. We're like, how are we going to collaborate? And we, we were like, we want to tackle the culture around hustle. Because you see Inc. Magazine, Forbes Magazine, some you know, 24-year-old kid just uh, launched this biggest blah, 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 blah. And everybody forgets that it takes five years, seven years sometimes to get to that overnight success. There are certainly people that have they've had overnight successes, but it's not right. the majority. And everybody gets, you know, they're constantly chasing and chasing and chasing that. And we were like, why don't we tackle something like that? And that, that was what the, the, that was the birth of the hustle culture. I and mean, it was it was really because we wanted people to get the real um, behind the scenes of what it takes to get there. And the steps that are that are involved, and and I think you've done a, you know you've done a great job of portraying that because it's it's not always all rosy, but it's it is worth it if you stick with it. Yep. So that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Ab absolutely. And, you know, and I, I agree with you, Audrey and Tyo. You have to go ahead and embrace yeah. those losses. You have to show. You know, I I'm, I believe that failure is what helps build character. And honestly, I really don't even believe in the word failure. Everything that we do in life is a learning experience and a stepping stone for the future. And if you're not constantly learning and embracing those experiences, then you know you're really missing out. Um, so, hey. Bruno, welcome hey. to hustle culture podcast episode one hey, that's awesome and it's an honor for me to be able to be a part of this and you guys are doing a great job i just joined for the last like 20 minutes and i was immediately hooked so you guys are doing a great job and you have already chosen a great guest so yeah. i'm learning a ton and just enjoying it thank you so much for creating this man you too yeah absolutely we're going to be doing this every Saturday uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. 
And, uh, you know, Tyle and I, we look forward to jamming out here, talking to folks that are doing some really amazing things in the world of business like mm -hmm. Audrey. And I see she just dropped yeah. off. So hopefully she can jump back in and, and join us so we can hopefully, close yeah. out. But, you know, again, we're just looking to do this to, to offer as much value to all of you amazing mm -hmm. viewers. And, out. You know what? You know what we want to do? Uh, Bruno, you'd be great for this. If you guys have people that you want us to highlight, um, mm -hmm. you know, Feel free to recommend them. Tell them if you have people in your your community that you feel like need to get more exposure. And that's what we want to do. We want to give them a chance to talk about their struggle. We want to get as many people outside of Blab to come on to talk about their story. So anyone listening right now, if you have a okay. guest, a friend, a family member that you feel like it's great for this, but needs to get the story out there and needs to talk about you think they're a great speaker. This is like think of it as a, as a TED talk, except it's a great, it's an engaging TED talk where you can get to ask what they did and their journey. But we want mm -hmm. to highlight, you know, everyday entrepreneurs who are just bringing it with their hustle. And um, whether it's struggles or whether it's success, we want to be able to highlight each and every part of that. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you guys know, anyone, cool. yeah, I, I would just like to ask a question if that's possible. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys have already uh, mentioned this, but here's, some, here, here's something that I struggle with. Because I embrace so much this hustle culture, this culture of getting things done, this culture of just getting started and figuring out along the way, um, I often struggle with saying no to new shiny things or new opportunities or new chances to do what I do, you know, chances to do my work. And what I often find myself in is with so much stuff to do that sometimes it's hard to do that work really well like I want to. So how do you guys handle this, uh, this balance between saying yes to everything and trying to do everything and really choosing a couple of things and really focusing on that mm -hmm. so you can make the biggest impact on those? Because my, my default is just saying, yes, yes, let's do it. Let's get it done. Let's start. Let's go. But then yeah. I have 10 things going on, right? I, I feel like I'm on Cirque du Soleil trying to juggle, you know, all kinds of things at the same time, man. <laughs> man that's a good imagery, right? <laughs> Come on, um, man. Can I, can I talk on that first? Quickly? Yes, please. Absolutely. So go for it. I, you know, I, Bruno, I really used to struggle with that myself. Hi, baby. <laughs> um, this is the reason why I hustle so hard, by the way. Oh, Love that is, this, the this is the real why. This is the real why right here. So go ahead. Sorry. Hey. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, Tim McDonald uh, posted this on Instagram maybe like six months ago, and I screenshotted it and I saved it, mm -hmm. and I've been obsessed with this forever. Uh, and the line is basically, "Are you working to collect the dots, or are you working?" No, excuse me. It's, are you working to connect to the dots or are you merely collecting dots? Um, and so mm. when you say yes to things, you have to ask yourself, is this taking me further or is this just a lateral move? Is this just me sitting here collecting more things that are taking away from my end goal or where I want to be? Um, mm. Is it, you know, providing that? Because I, like you, from a long time, you know, especially coming from this uh, background of, oh my gosh, if I don't take this job, I can't pay bills this month. It's a scarcity mentality of, I have to say yes to everything or nothing will be there. Um, yeah, FOMO. And yeah, it's FOMO, right? Especially when it comes yeah. to clients and opportunities. But what I realized is when I was able to narrow that down and only say yes to the things that were driving me forward, sometimes it mm -hmm. meant being in a little scary position financially. But what it also did was allow me to ask for more money on bigger contracts because I was more hyper-focused mm -hmm. on something and delivering mm -hmm. a specialty. So, you know, it's, I said this the other night at an event. Somebody said, well, my market is everybody. And I said, eh, if oh. you're marketing to everybody, you're marketing to nobody. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Same thing when you're saying yes to things. If you're saying yes to everybody, you know, and you're not actually moving forward, you have to be able to say no to the things that aren't uh, taking you down the road. Mm, yeah. yeah. And, and you're right on one thing. Actually, you're right on several things, many things. Uh, but one thing stood out for me, which was maybe when we say yes to something, it's because we are afraid to actually follow through on the things that we were working on. It's like an escape, a momentary escape to start a new thing. Go ahead, Tyler and Carlos, please. Uh, yeah, and I, I think really um, when we say no to some things, it's because we're making room for a better yes in other areas, to be honest. Yeah. And, you know, I'd, I'd say great question, uh, Bruno, you know, for me, it's all about prioritization of time, 
time is an asset. And, you know, everyone talks about money being an asset. Mm-hmm. For me, it's time. There's only so many hours in the day that you can actually operate to try to generate revenue. And let's face it, we all have to sleep. You know, we have families, we have other priorities that take us away from our jobs or our businesses. So I'm big, like Audrey and Tayo, big in collaboration, but you realistically cannot collaborate with everyone. You can't be involved in every business venture, even though you would love to. And everything has to align. At the end of the day, everything has to be intertwined and connected because, you know, if not, you're just going to be going in a, in a lot of different directions. Yeah. So. Great question. And I think what we want to do is we want to keep the seat open uh, to bring someone else on. So thank you. Yeah, you're so awesome. Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Tyo, what are your builds on that? Um, I mean, to be honest, though, it's, 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 I'm still, I'm still like thinking of that, that collect quote. If you're not connecting dots, you're collecting dots. I just, cause I think, I think it's, I yeah. think it's so true. And that, I mean, the only thing that I think of is when we, um, we had a conversation earlier because uh, we, we, we both do a lot of things. And, and we were saying, if because you already know I host a podcast, and we were saying, you know, what can we do to provide value? And I was like, you know, should I say yes to another thing? And you were saying the same thing. Should I say yes to another thing? And we were like, but this is, this is something we're both passionate about. This is something that connects us. And this is going to bring value right. to many people. And because honestly, Carlos, you've gotten many requests to co host, and I've gotten the same thing. And it's, it's, it's the same thing. I was like, if, I don't, if I'm not on Blab every day, I'm going to miss out on all the community building. But then I was saying, am I just, like you said, to use your word, collecting dots, am I just there every day and not providing value or am I wasting my time? And, and I, you know, honestly, so I, I've started to apply that mindset is like prioritize for progress. I saw that quote there. So you prioritize what's important to you. And then that's the only way that you can advance that. So that was my thinking, Carlos. What were you thinking? No, same thing, you know, so we've talked about Blab and, you know, Audrey, I know this is your first Blab, you know, Ty and I, we've been on here for a little while now, and it's easy to get sucked into the matrix and to be on here and hop in and out Blabs. And again, going back to prioritization of time, you almost have to take a step back and think of how do I want my presence to be seen when I'm hosting shows or when I'm engaging, you know, in other people's shows. And, you know, I'm just a big proponent of, Try, don't try to be everywhere for the sake of being everywhere. Try to be on mediums where you can make the biggest impact and have the biggest reach possible. I think you touched okay. on it before about followers. Anyone out there can buy followers to have these vanity metrics. But if you don't have influence, then followers just really mean nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So, Audrey, while we, while we wait for someone else to, to jump in, tell us how can the community get behind you and support you? Uh, well, I'm really looking to engage with other people that want to get behind the worthy women philosophy, right? So Startup DTLA, that's here. We've been talking about spinning off worthy women as its own conference eventually. I've had, I kid you not, the most amazing feedback from people. Our events are selling out within 72 hours with 100-person wait lists for people trying to get on these, which means we may have to be periscoping them, I think, or doing live streams so people can get access. Um but really looking to explore opportunities where we can um, support entrepreneurs in different environments, right? And have the Worthy Women Series in other places mm-hmm. um, and connecting, right? If somebody's passionate about office space in downtown LA and how to fill it or how to get, or, you know, they're a property owner and they want to get startups in there and figure out a way where they can support the startup community in downtown. Those are the people I want to talk to because I have tons of startups saying, where, who are the stakeholders and how do we connect with them? Because they seem like they're unobtainable and they're not. We, it's just a matter of being, and bringing them together. Absolutely. Oh, and- look who it is. <laughs> Vincent. Vincent Orlick in the house. Vince. Welcome, Vincent. What's up, guys? Hustle culture. Hey. Hello. All right. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so this is, you're going to be, our last guest because we're going to wrap up soon and audrey's been great with us with our time so we want to make sure we're respectful of that but um yeah what you got to say hold on hold on the audio isn't working all right well it, we can hear you by the way i think it is working you can hear me i yes. can't hear you for some reason uh, okay if you can, uh well, you just heard me say okay hold on wait let me do this <laughs> <laughs> he's reading <laughs> lips yeah. Okay. In the meantime, um, um, Saba wanted to know she would love to learn more about the events. I think she's in the area, so she wants to know anything she can do to support. Um, I know you said that earlier, but she's a fabulous, 
female entrepreneur as well. And, 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 and you know, that's something you're passionate about. So, you know, maybe both of you should connect, but if there's any upcoming event or any way that she can use that, yep. to get more people. Absolutely. Hit um, me up on Twitter. I'm happy to connect and, um, and get some private invites out for some wait list only things, maybe sneak in a few people if the fire marshal doesn't shut me down. Uh, and then, uh, and I can certainly, I share these things on Twitter all the time and you can link from, um, uh, our website, sign up for the, uh, email list. Okay. All right. I was hearing feedback for the, I wasn't sure. Um, all right. So yeah, I mean, all good. Is it, is it good? Good. Yeah. All right. So oh, here's what I was doing. I was, I was putting on the Chromecast. It was on the, oh. it was on the big screen. So it was like the audio wasn't coming through my computer. Gotcha. All you Chromecasters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Carlos knows. Carlos tried it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Carlos. Yes, sir. What, 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 what's, what's, what's the, what's the, what's the word? We got five minutes. How do we wrap this up? About five minutes. Vincent wasn't sure if you were coming in to ask Audrey a question or just say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I well, I just wanted to say. Um, so Audrey, like, me and Audrey have been connected online for I don't know, probably at least a year now, and like, she's her stuff is awesome. Like everything that she's doing, you're you're awesome, Audrey. You know, I think that I'm a big supporter. Um, I'm. I mean, I'm in the Phoenix area, and we're trying to not so much with the tech industry, but with the social media side, with the social media community. And, and like, I, a lot of the stuff that you do is, is definitely inspiring for, for us here. And for me with like the whole social media club thing, I, I'm, I'm trying to follow a lot of different people's leads mm-hmm. and, and to, to how you are getting things started. So okay. um, we also have a big tech community here. I don't know if it's on the level of what you guys are doing, but it's, it's getting there. It's getting there. Um, and I'm just, I'm glad you jumped on Blab because it's, this is, this is the future. It's actually, I think it's, I think it's the present, it's the present, but I think this is going to be huge. So this is going to be probably a really good platform for you if you so choose to, um, embrace it. I'm embracing, I'm embracing for your request. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? I've got Instagram and Twitter. How many more platforms I know, do I have? I know. Well, that's the common response. And like, everybody's like, oh, well, I tried Periscope. I tried Meerkat. It's no good. It's, but it's, it's all monologue and it's dialogue. You connect with whoever you want to connect with pretty much. Yep. It's what you do with it. Like with anything. Yeah. Yeah. A well, great yeah. show, you guys. I mean, it's, I, I've been sitting here with the baby kind of following along and, She's uh she's been enjoying it too. Now she's on a curious George though, so you guys well, you lost out. Okay. I'm I'm gonna join her soon on Curious George. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, but uh, no, I mean yeah, did I don't think we have any more guests, but we just we just wanted to to really thank you, man. Carlos and I, we uh want people like you to just come out and bring it every single week. We want we want people that that you know relate to what you're doing. We want you to inspire an audience. We want to create a generation of people that are going out and making an impact in whatever they're doing in their society. And, um, you know, we, we were we were very honored. Uh, you know, Carlos sent me this message like, we got to get her on. <laughs> uh, so so we, we're very honored um, that we that we got here. So I um, just want to say goodbye. And. Thank you all for coming on. Thank you guys for the opportunity. And thank you, everybody, for all your support and making my very first Blab experience uh, amazing. <laughs> and one, one last question, Ms. Bellis. Where can either listeners or viewers out there find you? Ah, Twitter and Instagram, at Audrey Bellis. Uh, Facebook, you can Audrey find Bellis. me as Audrey Bellis. Um, notoriously known for selfieing and oversharing. Uh, but through those channels, I post... <laughs> tons of events, things that are happening, and I want to connect in real life. So if you're local in the area, you're visiting, you're in town, I want to meet you in person, not just online. Awesome. All right. Great. Keep Thanks, bringing it. Guys. You rock. And uh, this concludes episode one of Hustle Culture.